because I think this is a disease that's very relevant to your region. Um, so this is, an, this is an RNA virus again, these are electron micrographs. It can be very easily differentiated under the electron microscope. Um, they're part of the order mononegaviriles, family paramyxaviridae, and they're an avula virus. And down here we have Newcastle disease. And you can see there's other diseases in this group so, uh, of paramyxaviridae, um, HEPA, uh, Hendra, Nipper, um, Rhinopest. So quite a well-known group of viruses. Now there are 12 serotypes of avian paramyxavirus, but the one we're concerned with here is Newcastle disease. So there's a single serotype, not like flu. Again, very similar structures on the virus to flu. Uh, what we have, the, what we call the HN and the F proteins, they have very similar function. And the genome, instead of being fragmented, is a single strand. So we don't have this problem of reassortment like we have with flu. Now the pathogenesis has quite a, a different spectrum to flu. Uh, from the uh, visotropic velogenic strains, so these are the acute lethal strains. Um, hemorrhagic lesions in the intestines would be quite normal with these. You can get a neurotropic presentation with one or more strains. Uh, that's obviously also high mortality, respiratory, neurological signs, uh, lesions in the gut will be absent with these though, okay? Mesogenic viruses, now these are interesting because they actually will cause mortality, although generally low. You can see neurological signs, and I'll come back to that because of relevance for vaccines. Now the lentogenic and the asymptomatic enteric, these are the avirulent strains, uh, either the lentogenic, which are basically what we use for vaccine, or the asymptomatic, which are present out there in wild bird populations, and will occasionally be seen in poultry. So this bird has got a profuse, you can probably just see a profuse green watery diarrhea, quite distinctive, quite an emaciated bird. Um, we have blindness in coordination, ataxia, flaccid wings. Uh, so obviously these are lame birds. Uh, we have particular hemorrhages uh, in, in both the gut and the proventriculus. That's quite a characteristic feature. And again, we have to assume, as with flu, that all avian species are potentially susceptible to APMV1. This is relevant when you're thinking about control as well. Um, Cytosines are particularly susceptible to APMV1. So this is why we have quarantine when these birds are moved legally as part of trade. Uh, we often get detections. So the host range of Newcastle virus is, uh, as with flu similarities, wild bird reservoir, uh, these viruses are low virulent. We always use the word virulent for NDs and pathogenic for flus. Um, for poultry, and of course, there are mechanisms whereby these viruses also switch into virulent forms. There are some wild bird reservoirs of virulent Newcastle disease. They're not well known. Um, in North America, historically, we know that your double-crested cormorants carry Newcastle disease, and they can maintain those virulent viruses quite nicely. I think, fortunately, cormorants don't tend to come into contact a lot with poultry. Um, and there are obviously other reservoirs that we don't fully understand. We do know that columbiforms, pigeons and doves, um, do carry uh, APMV1, and I'll, uh, this is described as pigeon paramyxavirus, so very relevant to the question you asked about racing pigeons. Uh, I think these, problem, these viruses are of less, much lower prevalence in the Americas than they are in Europe and Asia, but what you've got to remember is they can be maintained in wild pigeons and doves if they enter into domestic poultry they become Newcastle disease because they have a tropism of virulence and when they first enter chickens they may actually be quite mild because they're quite pigeon adapted strains. They're not very um, efficacious at replicating gallinaceous birds but by passage through different individuals within a flock they can become more virulent and acquire their normal phenotype. So they would be subject to control. Geographic distribution um, that's outbreaks since 2005 reported to the OIE, and you can see the Americas uh, do have a number of outbreaks. 
These are areas, this is a map of, of predicted threat uh, over time using 2005 to 2011. And if you look in this region here, there are some countries that never report Newcastle disease. It's quite curious, really, because I think there's, you know, with land boundaries the way they are, it, it does seem odd that some countries never see Newcastle disease at all, even though they've got sizable poultry populations. Now, you know, maybe that tells you you've got a very efficient vaccination program. Um, but equally, there are other countries that do quite regularly report um, with, within this uh, archipelago. So, you know, and I know that you've had sporadic incidents, but essentially this is a rare virus for the Caribbean. Um, these are um, focusing in, now I suppose I have a question, is there under-reporting? Quite a lot of these cases occur in backyard and village sector. Uh, and of course there is widespread use of vaccination. So diagnosis, same principles as we looked at for flu. The OIE manual is, is the Bible. The sampling, exactly the same, because obviously you want to be doing differential diagnosis. Um, and so, you know, a standard set of samples applies to both diseases. Methods for spread, all the same principles, but some slight subtle differences. We've got sectors here that perhaps are not so important for flu. How important they are to your region, I don't know. You've mentioned racing pigeons. Clearly, that is a risk. I don't know whether PPMV1 has ever been found in racing pigeons in the Caribbean. Um, obviously, backyard production. Indy is a big problem. Uh, in prof in, in, this is, you know, sustenance, a source of, uh, of protein. Um, there's a heavy reliance in some communities on it. And Newcastle disease is a problem in village chickens in a way that flu isn't, which is why, you know, uh, there are outreach programs now trying to get vaccine into village sectors. And I, I, I don't get a sense of what your uptake is, although I think from some results I saw published about seropositivity, it would indicate that even your yard fowl, which probably come out of market systems, I'm guessing, do have a reasonable level of vaccine immunity. Fighting cocks, of course, these, although I used the slide earlier for flu, this actually was taken in California, which was a, uh, where there was a significant outbreak in 2003. And it was due to the activities of this sector that it took so long to bring it under control. Airborne spread has been demonstrated um, over relatively short distance. Contaminated food is, is definitely a problem. Uh, contaminated water, of course. Uh, fomite spread by non-avian animals. And of course, poorly poor vaccine. And also vaccination teams and thinning crews. These are really... Um, significant ways of spreading. And then, of course, we've got the products. Uh, the virus, obviously, virulent virus can be is systemic, so it can be present in the meat and the offal and, and eggs. Um, feathers, uh, feces, movement of people. So, of course, control is mainly through, depending on what area and what your policy is, it might be that it's through slaughter. It might be just you rely on, on um, vaccination to keep the infection down, and it is not perceived as a big problem. But, of course, where quite often where there's heavy vaccination, the virus can become endemic, the virulent virus. But ND vaccines are probably the best veterinary vaccines that are, that are around. They have been around for decades and they basically, they do do the job. Uh, they, when applied properly, uh, they can prevent death, clinical signs, they can reduce egg problems. Um, and in, in fact, some cases, bizarrely, you know, for, for trade, some trading partners demand um, that a country vaccinates. Now, I'm not going to go through all of this, but it, you know, the, the advantage is, of course, we've got one serotype. But we all know that vaccination in a field setting, there are a lot of things that can go wrong. So you can have the best vaccine, but if it's not applied properly in a field setting with proper cold chain, you can end up with vaccine failure. So there are lots of pitfalls if it's not applied properly. Uh, increasingly now, the, the approach tends to be you use a live lentogenic virus, uh, and these can even be applied, of course, at the hatchery. Um, and then you um, will use a boost. Uh, so these are primary vaccines, and then you can use a boost with a, an inactivated vaccine, you know, for instance, in laying birds, where you get a long-lasting um, immunity. Uh, and so these used in combination are you know, generally very successful regimes for older birds. As I said, mesogenic vaccines are still used, uh, but, but less so. Obviously, if vaccine is being used to control, then you need to understand 
what is the risk of disease occurring, and of course in many countries where ND is endemic, they have little option but to vaccinate. Just to summarise, yes, wild bird reservoir, uh, it can be present in other populations which come in closer contact with poultry, such as the Columbia forms. Virulence is very much linked to the strain, but it'll also depend on the host affected. There is a spectrum of outbreak characteristics, but of course we do have good preventative and prophylactic vaccines. And I think probably we've lived with this since 1926, since it was first described by Doyle in Newcastle, that's where the name came from. Probably, even though we've used vaccine extensively and we've largely controlled the problem, there's probably no reason to suppose that we'll still have the same situation in the next 89 years.